Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. It's been said that you can always recognize a werewolf simply by shaking hands. If the handshaker has hair on the inside of his palms, QED, a werewolf. Of course, this is an old wives' tale. As for me, I'm perfectly willing to accept the fact that the whole idea of werewolves was absurdly exaggerated by the superstitious during the Middle Ages. However, I would like some explanation of the concept everyone recognizes today of the subconscious, something inside a person which can take over and utterly control a person's mind and actions, particularly under great stress. Our mystery drama, Night of the Howling Dog, was especially adapted from the classic by Algernon Blackwood for the Mystery Theater by Murray Burnett and stars Mason Adams and Norman Rose. The pages of fiction are filled with surrogates passionately pleading the causes of other lovers to beautiful ladies. The characters of Cyrano de Bergerac, John Alden courting Patricia for Miles Standish, and the devil himself serenading the beautiful Margarita on behalf of Faust. These are only a few examples that come immediately to mind. However, I had never heard of a lover deputizing an animal to forward his suit until now. And to bring you this amazing story, I introduce an eyewitness. It's strange that as I approach the end of my years, I now find more people willing to believe the stories of my adventures with my employer, the famed psychologist of the occult, Duane Carter. When I was working so closely with Duane and writing down these excursions into the dark recesses of men's soul and minds, I found nothing but skeptics. Today, perhaps since we know more, we now realize there are still things we don't know. At any rate, let me start at the beginning of this incredible phenomenon. It all began when Duane and I said goodbye at London's Waterloo Station on a hot July day in 1912. Now, Ernie, we've got a full fall schedule, so you'll be sure and get plenty of rest. I want you to be raring to go when we meet in Stockholm on August 15th. Unless, of course, you should send for me sooner. Send for you? If I'm going to need you, Duane, then I'm hardly going to have a restful vacation. Nonsense. Both of us know the strange effects a stay in the wilderness can have on people who wear the trappings of civilization the rest of the year. Well, you were the one who prescribed getting back to nature as the prescription that straightened out Timothy Manning's life. If he hadn't come to consult you, he'd still be preaching in a pulpit, making his wife and daughter's lives miserable. But Timothy isn't the only member of your little party. Are you are you trying to sound a warning? If so, you'll have to be more specific. Well, I have nothing specific in mind. Just a feeling that will very probably turn out to be wrong. You go ahead and enjoy yourself, Ernie. And forget what I said. Duane must have known. The one thing I could not do was forget what he said. Duane Carter's whole reputation as a scientist was based on his uncanny sixth sense. An intuition that enabled him to handle cases too bizarre for other psychiatrists. So I was more than ordinarily alert as our boat approached the shore of the small island we'd chosen for our camp. Easy there, Ernie. Peter, lend him your hand and we'll pull the cutter further up the beach. Then unload, and the ladies will see to the tents and other supplies. Ah, this is the life. Room for body and mind. Just the place for a man to refuel his soul. And how does a man go about doing that, Reverend? <laughs> I'll let Peter Sangre answer that. Peter, here's a perfect opportunity for you to show Ernie how much you've learned since you started studying with me. There'll be time enough for theology lessons later, Dad. Right now, Peter could be very useful in giving Mother and me a hand with some of these supplies. Oh, I'll be happy to, any time at all. I'm always very happy to help you, Miss Manning. 
Peter Sangri was a young Canadian studying for the ministry under the Reverend Manning's tutelage. He'd been staying with the family back in New York, and it was obvious that he'd been smitten by the laughing eyes of Joan Manning. So obvious that it was sometimes embarrassing to watch the depth of yearning in his eyes. This was painfully evident the first night when Peter, Joan, and I joined forces exploring our island. Well, I never realized the Baltic Sea had this many small islands so close to shore. It's so beautiful. The water's so calm. I wish we had the canoe. We could paddle to the other islands while we still have the northern lights. Good idea. You and Peter wait here and I'll go across and fetch No! Let Peter get the canoe. You and I will wait here. Oh, you bet. I'll be back as soon as I can. Well, Joni, what was that all about? You found me rude. Well, let's say very definite about not wanting to be alone with Peter. Oh, dear. It's very obvious, then. I'm sure he noticed. I wouldn't worry about him, Joan. Surely you know he's madly in love with you, and you shouldn't feel upset if you don't like him. I don't dislike him. It's just that I see his eyes on me, seeking, even demanding, and, and I'm afraid he might do or say something that would lead to unpleasantness. You, Joan Manning, the fearless, frightened... Atlas, I'm serious. There's something about Peter that makes me feel creepy. Something I don't think he knows himself. I'll confess it draws me, attracts me, but at the same time it makes me afraid. Joan, I don't know whether you're trying to tell me you're afraid of Sangri or uh, something in you. My heart tells me there's something in Peter Sangri. Something buried deep inside him. Something dark and perhaps even dangerous. And I'm desperately afraid and desperately curious. How long has Peter been studying for the ministry with your dad? Almost a year. And this is the first time that you've had this feeling about him? Yes. It only happened since we came here. Away from New York and civilization. It seems almost... What he's been waiting for. What we've both been waiting for. The business of setting up camp for the first few days relegated that strange conversation to the back of my mind. But the Reverend Timmy brought it back sharply with a strange prayer one night. We give thanks to you, O Lord, for our safe arrival. We also give thanks for our excellent health and pray this may continue for all of us. And the weather be fair, the fish be plentiful, and that nothing from the kingdom of darkness nor any evil thing disturb our nighttime tranquility. Daddy, I brought that on. Just a thought, Joan. It came into my mind, and I let the Lord know of it. Reverend, I don't think we should put thoughts like that in the Lord's mind. I think I can explain, Mr. Simpson. Were you, Peter? Yes, sir. You see, I don't know if any of the others felt it. But I know that I sense something. Some presence here on the island with us. But that's impossible. Our exploration showed there were two things lacking on our little island. Fresh water and animals. I didn't say anything about an animal, Joan. I said a presence. Now, come, children. Perhaps my prayer was out of place. Let's all be off to our tents and a good night's rest. What was that? Who's there? Uh, whoever it is, let's not play tricks. I know someone's trying to frighten me. I'm... I'm coming out and see whoever it is that's... Playing this childish game. <gasps> Joan. I'm really sorry about that prayer last night. It, it obviously upset you and made you dream about some animal or other growling around your tent. I tell you, I distinctly heard the howling of a dog. Didn't anyone else hear it? Of course not. No one else heard it because you dreamed it. Because of the lack of water, there's not an animal of any size on the whole island. 
You know we have to fetch our water from that little island across the way. I know what I heard. And it wasn't a dream. Well, there's nothing to prevent some animal from swimming over. A deer, for instance, might easily land in the night and decide to take a look around. Well, look, Mr. Simpson, I'd like you and the other men to come along with me. Mother, you stay here. You've already seen the tracks. And I want Daddy to apologize to me and admit that I'm not having bad dreams. All right, now. There, look. Look at those marks on the outside of the tent. Are you going to tell me that they're not animal tracks? Certainly they are. These tracks appear to have been made by some type of fairly large animal. I I apologize. I'm sorry I doubted you, darling. Oh, Daddy, I'm so frightened. I'm just plain scared. <laughs> Mr. Simpson, look here. Look at these marks. That brute must have been scratching around my tent, too. It looks that way. These are the same marks. Did you hear anything? Not me. Since I've come here, I sleep like a log. The Reverend, would you come over here to Peter's tent for a minute? Coming, Simpson. Really strange. I wonder if Mrs. Manning heard anything. After all, her tent is right next to Jones. Timmy, Timmy, what do you make of those tracks? Looks like an animal, right enough. Tell you what I'd appreciate, Simpson, if you don't mind. Well, I'm here to help. Well, why don't you take Joan out for the day? Uh, on a hike or in the canoe. And see if you can calm her down. I thank you for taking me on this canoe trip today. But I know Dad suggested it. That's right. But I thank you anyway. It's kind of you. Have you noticed any change in our friend Peter Sangri? You mean his attitude towards me? Good Lord, no. If anything, his devotion has become even more obvious. Well, what do you mean, changed? Well, he seems much more self-reliant. Almost as if he... As if... I don't know how to put it, but... Almost. Almost as if this is where he belongs. So you sense something strange about him, too. No, 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 no. Not strange. It's just that he he seems to fit in better here than when I first met him. He's, he's more confident. He's sure of himself. Yes, I felt that. And the more confident he gets, the more frightened I get. For the next few days and nights, there was no excitement. And our camp life seemed to have settled into a routine. Until one night, the quiet was shattered by screams coming from the <laughs> Gurney! Hang on, Gurney, we're coming! Joan! Are you all right? Something touched me! Something touched me! I felt it through the tent! What she's saying, Ernest? Daddy, Daddy! The, the same growling and scratching as before. And, and, and there was a great tearing blow and... Right next to my face. Tore your tent. No doubt about that, Reverend. You can see the gap where it, the thing or whatever it is, ripped right through. The dog again. We must do something. The first thing to do is to get over to the stockade and get a fire going. What's going on? I broke my rifle. If it's that animal again, let me have it. Come on, Peter, help me start a fire. What in the world do you think it is, Mr. Simpson? It surely can't be a dog. It can't be very far away. We'll organize a hunt at once, this very minute. Now, slow, slow down, slow down, Reverend. Action, Ernie. Any action to stop panic. We've gone over every inch of this island, and there's no living creature on it besides ourselves. Peter's right, Reverend. Not even a squirrel could have gotten by us. All right. I know what it was. A dog from one of the farms on the Algerian. A dog that's turned wild. It was attracted by our fires and the smell of food, and now it's gone back to where it came from. That's what it was. Oh, Daddy, you don't really believe what you just said. You can't believe that. You just can't. Occultists insist that events have souls. 
souls given to them by the emotion and thoughts of those concerned with them. This in itself is a terrifying concept, because I can think of the souls of some events that must have shriveled with terror and agony that's indescribable. I'll be back with Act Two and the very strange events on the Baltic Island in a moment. Dream on WABC. Virtues of life and vacations in the untrammeled wilderness have long been extolled in song and story. We've all longed for the starry nights with the wind sighing softly through the friendly branches of the protecting trees. But nature also has a savage side, and sometimes a trip to the wilderness can bring out whatever primitive savage lurks within us. I hate the rain, especially when I'm in the woods. I thought you could use today to catch up on your study, Peter. Reverend says I'll pass my exams with flying colors and become a full-fledged minister in the fall. Well, Timmy should know. He should know more about his own daughter, too. What? What, what does that mean? Oh, nothing. I guess we're all upset by... by what's happened with Joan. Well, of course we are, but I don't understand what you meant about Joan's father. Forget it. I'm sorry I said it. I just wish one of us would be able to track down that dog, or whatever it is, that's gotten Joan in such a state. She should be all right with her mother. You know that she's moved into Mrs. Manning's tent now, and there should be no more nonsense. Nonsense? Is that what you think is so frightening for Joan? Maybe you should join forces with her father. I had no trouble going to sleep after my rather strange conversation with young Sangri, but suddenly I found myself wide awake. I jumped from dead sleep to absolute wakefulness in a single instant. The rain had stopped. I went outside and sniffed the delicious clean air. A pallid half-moon just sinking into the sea threw a spectral light between the trees. And then, just twenty feet away across the paths, I saw a head thrust round the edge of Peter Sangri's tent. The head of an animal. An animal that had the appearance of no animal I'd ever seen before. Terror struck me. I knew it was the animal. And as I watched, riveted to the spot, the thing turned, slipped between the trees, and vanished. Wake up, Peter! Wake up! Peter, come on, come on, come on! Peter, come on! The, The beast... The beast has been here in your tent. I swear it was about to leap at your throat. What, what, what are you saying? Let's not waste time. Quick, get your gun before Joan is attacked. Joan? Oh, yeah, yes, all right. Yes, let's get over there. I'm with you. Yes. I see the tracks. It's a wolf. That's what it is. A wolf lost among the islands and starving to death. Yes, I don't think so. It was unlike any animal I've ever seen. Whatever it is, it must be killed. Joan must be protected. I'll sleep all day and sit up all night and shoot the beast the minute I see it. No. No, I don't think this is anything that we can deal with. I have a better plan. I'm going to send for the one man I know who can help. Dwayne Carter. He will know what to do. Dwayne Carter? The psychic doctor? Yes. Then you think, what, it's something of that sort? I am certain of it. Although nothing Duane Carter ever did took me completely by surprise. I was astonished to find a letter care of general delivery in the Wax Home Post Office. It was from Carter, giving a Stockholm address and stating that a phone call would bring him to Wax Home that same day. And so that night, Duane Carter joined us on the island. And after dinner, with Peter also sitting in, I told him of the strange events. You did well to send for me, Ernie. What we have to deal with here is a werewolf. A werewolf? Oh, surely these things are... Rare enough, I'm happy to say, Mr. Sangri. Now, you say that no one has been injured so far. No, surely there can't be any question of this poor, starved beast injuring anybody, can there? I hope not. But what makes you think the creature is starved? What? I... I can't tell you. It... Except that I felt from the beginning it was in pain and starved. Although why I feel this never occurred to me until you asked. Mm. You really know very little about it, then. I really know nothing at all. 
भक्ति get away today I think Reverend for the safety of all concerned it would be better not to leave the island just now both mrs. Manning and I are grateful for your presence dr. Carter but I can't help thinking that perhaps all of our problems would have been solved if you hadn't stopped me when I had the brute in my gun sights had you fired and had you killed the thing you would have committed murder murder now you've got me completely confounded. How can killing this... this thing possibly be murder? Well, this thing, as you refer to it, Reverend, is a man. One of this camping party. A man gone savage. Well, I saw the thing. That was no man. That was a dog or a wolf. Of course. You see, this is a case of modern lycanthropy. Lycanthropy? Werewolves? Those superstitions of the Middle Ages can have no actual significance today. We are face to face with a modern example of what I believe has always been a profound fact. Fact? Oh, come now, Dr. Carter. You heard of the astral body, or as I prefer to describe it, the fluidic body. It has the power, under certain conditions, of projecting itself and becoming visible to others. Well, aren't you talking about two different things altogether, Doctor? astral body is something people can accept because it's a human form, not an animal. Yes, that's true. But the fluidic body can assume forms other than human, and such forms will be determined by the dominating thought and wish of the owner. You've lost me. You've never really understood the effect of this primitive camping life upon all the members of your party. Old, old instincts deeply buried in the subconscious. Instincts no one ever dreamed they had suddenly come forth in a primitive setting. Well, I'm honestly trying to follow you, Doctor, but ancient instincts and atavism are terms which hardly explain a roaming animal with teeth, claws, and a thirst for blood. That last is your term, not mine. But it's a very exact one. I would say that, that what we have here is an animal that's impelled to bathe in the very heart's blood of the one it desires. And if I didn't know your reputation, I'd say you have a very strange way of reassuring people. Fear is rooted in ignorance. Reverend, let's suppose that an extremely sensitive young man has fallen very deeply in love with your daughter. Back in New York, this moonstruck young fellow isn't taken very seriously by Joan, and he knows it. Nevertheless, he loves, and he knows that, too. Does he know what you're trying to tell me? If you're asking if he's conscious of the change that comes over him, no. Oh, but I still refuse Reverend, to... surely you don't question the violence that's in all mankind. It lurks underneath the surface. And here, on this island, where we shed the trappings of civilization, he feels strong and free. And the feelings of love he's been suppressing back in New York batter at his consciousness, determined to force their way to the surface. And at night, when he sleeps and his mind is relaxed, he dreams. The beast that ripped Joan's arm was no dream. Granted, but this wild force within him becomes fierce and savage when he sleeps. And his frustration turns into half devotion, half beast. And that is the form that his astral body might well assume. Well, if I grant these wild assumptions, why should I feel easier in my mind? Well, if you realize that this transformation isn't deliberate, then you can also understand that 
Well, that it is not necessarily evil. You say that to me after seeing Joan's arm. I tell you that this werewolf is no more than the passionate and fierce instincts of a man, frustrated by day, looking by night for his mate. That night we built the largest campfire we'd ever had. And all of us retired early. However, Reverend Timothy, Duane, and I had agreed to meet in Duane's tent. I'm going to open the tent flap now. Keep your voices down and strike no matches. Reverend, is the camp asleep? Well, Peter is. I can't answer for the women. I think they're sitting up. Mm, that may be for the best. Could you fill me in on what we're supposed to be watching for? Is it an animal or... Report the least sound to me. And do nothing on your own. Nothing. You understand? Right. All right. Shh. Something out there? I'm not sure. Nelson, you, you stay here. I'll let you know. Timmy and I sat alone for a few minutes, but the good reverend was restless. I don't much care for this waiting game with you and Carter, but he wouldn't hear of me staying with my family. He said it might prevent something happening. He knows. You must trust him. Well, it's either this astral body or double business, as he calls it, or else it's possession, as described in the Bible. But I'm sure of one thing. Whatever it is, it's bad. And I brought my rifle. You brought your rifle, but Duane said... And my Bible. <sighs> well, one is useless in this situation, and the other is dangerous. The only way we can win in this game is to do what Duane tells us. That's the safest way, believe me. I'm warning you, Ernie. If anything happens to Joan tonight, I'll shoot first and pray afterwards. Now, what the devil is Carter up to? Sneaking around Peter's tent and making gestures. He looks weird disappearing in and out of the fog. I think Just I... wait, as he told us. Remember, he has the knowledge that we both lack. Well, he seems to be coming back now. Yes, he's heading this way. Peter. Peter is in a very deep sleep. His condition is almost cataleptic. Which means, Doctor? The fluidic body may be released at any moment. Now, I've taken steps to imprison it in the tent. It can't get out until I permit it. Be alert for any signs of movement now. I'd better hold on to my rifle. Reverend, I told you there is to be no shooting unless you want a murder. Anything done to the double acts by repercussion on the physical body of the man himself. Now, you better take the cartridges out of that rifle now. All right, Doctor. But I hope and pray you know what you're doing. It was with poor grace that Timmy slipped the cartridges out of his rifle. And then all three of us sat and waited for whatever was to come. It seemed hours. But in reality, it was only a few minutes before we heard it. That's Peter's tent shaking like that, Doctor. It's trying to get out. I hear it. All right, Reverend. Quickly, the women's tent. All right. I'll take my rifle just in case. I can always use it as a club. I urge you, Reverend, to be careful what you do. Because I told you this case is complicated. And it's my belief that your daughter and Peter are made for each other. And I think she knows it every bit as much as he does. Men in love have been known to do foolish things. An English monarch gave up a throne for love. And we've heard of men who turned themselves inside out just to please their beloved. But uh, for me, at any rate, this is the first time I've heard of a lover turning himself into a werewolf. <laughs> Statistically, there are more people who claim to have sighted UFOs than there are those who claim to have seen ghosts. But the lowest of all in number are those who claim to have experienced the numbing terror of having come face to face with a werewolf. Come along with me now as we share that experience with one of the few who have seen and dealt with that dread creature. From where Duane and I stood, 
It was less than 20 feet to Peter Sangri's tent. And although the wind had freshened considerably, it wasn't the wind that was making the canvas of his tent swell and shake. That shaking was caused by something inside the tent trying to get out. The hair on the nape of my neck rose. As we approached the tent, Duane held up his hand. Ernie. Ernie, I want you to see it before I release it. So that if anything untoward should happen, you may be able to deal with it without me. But the way you reassured the Reverend, you said that if... Ernie, you know that we're dealing with tremendous forces that are still only partially understood. What do you want me to do? Well, as we approach the tent, I want you to kneel down and tell me what you see when I hold the flap back. All right. There's something in there, all right. But you must be able to see it and describe it before our chance releasing it. As my eyes became accustomed to the dim interior of the tent, I could make out Sangri's form lying under the blankets, while over him and around him flew a dark mass. All I could make out was a pointed muzzle and sharp ears plainly visible against the sides of the tent, and I also caught an occasional gleam of fiery eyes and white fangs. There's nothing to fear. I told you that before. How are you... How are you holding that... that thing there? There are some things I don't think you should know, Ernie. But I'll only tell you that it has to do with electrical impulses from the mind. You see, we all emanate a certain amount of electricity. And, well, just think of it as brain waves. Now step back a little now, because I'm going to release it. What'll it do? Hopefully it will listen to me. And I will be able to guide it. And if it doesn't? We'll cross that bridge if and when we come to it. Now step back. Keep your eyes fixed on the tent flap. Ernie, watch closely. And then I saw it. An animal. Neck and muzzle thrust forward. An animal about the size of a calf, leaner than a mastiff. And yet, Peter was easily recognizable. It was the head of an animal. But the face... It was Peter Sangri. Sangri. It is werewolf double. What do we do now? Well, I'll, I'll try to speak with him. Sangri. Peter Sangri, do you recognize me? Do you realize what it is that you really desire when you assume this form? Sangri. You must listen to me. Good Lord, doing can that be? Of course. A mating call. You shouldn't be surprised. It is probably Joan. You must remember she practically told you that she was afraid of something deep down in her. But she's not... The only salvation for both Joan and Peter is for me to lead Sangri's double to the object for which it yearns. Listen. That's coming from across the lagoon. Duane. Peter's double, a werewolf. He's gone. Although my eyes had been fixed upon the animal in front of the tent, somehow it disappeared. One moment it was there, muzzle lifted, sniffing the wind, and then it was gone, like a thing of the wind and a trick of vision. Quickly, Ernie, start following through the trees. Where will you be? I must check out Peter's tent. Why? What for? To make sure that his werewolf double cannot return until I permit it. I'll join you in a few moments. After circling Peter's tent... Duane caught up to me and we ran at full speed through the woods, always guided by the now fairly loud howling. And then suddenly the trees fell away and we were on the edge of the lagoon. And there, sharply defined against sea and sky, Joan! Stand still and remain quiet. But there's something wrong with her. She looks half asleep. She is fully asleep and we must not wake her. What are you saying? She's sleepwalking. If we wake her, the shock might injure her permanently. But the werewolf! What will... She's on her way to meet him. You see, she's been irresistibly drawn to him from the beginning. Well, then how do you explain the torn tent the other night and the wounds on her arm? Wasn't she asleep then? Not deeply enough. She awoke and was terrified instead of pleased. Now, however, she's in a deep enough sleep to throw off the conventional shackles of civilization that have bound her and admit this man is her mate. Then she really loves Peter? Yes, profoundly. 
The canoe just coming around the point. Isn't that, isn't that Reverend Timothy? Yes, it is. Well, what's he doing here? Probably following John. At least he had the sense to take the canoe and not wake her. Well, what will he do when he... Ernie, you're right. We're going to have to warn him. That's too late. There goes Peter's double. Quick, get to Joan. The Reverend's got a gun. Oh, you made him unload it. He's got hold of a pistol. Hand aside, Joan. Out of my line of fire. Put that gun down, you fool. Put it... Oh, idiot. Ernie, get to Joan. Help her. What? What are all of you doing here? Where's Peter? Where is he? Oh, thank the Lord. Joni, you're all right. Where'd Peter go? He disappeared so suddenly. He cried out that he was hurt. We hope that he wasn't hurt seriously. I though. hope the brute's dead. Don't ever say that, Reverend. Unless you want murder on your soul. Murder? Why do you use that word? If anyone's done anything to him, then he's done it to me, too. Because Peter is... I know, I know, my dear. He's your love. And I think we can bring him to you. Or perhaps you to him. But we must go to your tent and wait for me. Now, Ernie, take care of her until I get back. Reverend, you better come with me. While Duane and the Reverend went off together, I helped Joan back to her tent. You must let me go to him, Mr. Simpson. I know he needs you me. You heard Duane. He said we should wait for him. Uh, I, I didn't know until tonight. That you love Peter. Yes. Duane knew that days ago. That's why we were there watching tonight and hoping that everything would go as we thought. And I think it would have, but for... Go on. But for what? But for an unfortunate happening. It was my father, wasn't it? Now, Joan, I think you should stay calm. It was Dad. He did something that... Something that hurt Peter. Hurt him badly, isn't it? And now he's lost, and so am I. You mustn't despair. <laughs> Everything will be different when Duane gets here. Oh, where is he? I think he's with your father, and I believe that they're both looking for Peter. Well, we should be helping him. Sometimes, Please. Joan, we help best by doing nothing. Oh. Trust me, Joan. Trust Duane. I'm sure that he'll be able to handle this. Pray that we're in time to help Peter's double return to Peter's physical body. Will that help, Joan? I think so. Now hold it. Now what? He hasn't been back to the tent. Excuse me just a moment. What are you doing? Arranging it so that if Peter's double does make it back here, he can get into the tent and back into Peter's body. More of your mumbo-jumbo. I'm trying to save a life you almost snuffed out. I saved my daughter's life. Her life was never in danger. I saw that beast throw itself at my Joan. I hadn't fired when I did. You would have seen a miracle. A transformation in that beast and in your daughter. Dr. Carter, I know your reputation, Reverend, but... I think we should stop quarreling. Both of us want the same thing. And this isn't doing either Joan or Peter any good. Now, I'm going to need your help. Well, you know I'll do everything I can. All right. But what I'm going to ask you to do, Reverend will go against your every instinct. I'm going to ask for your belief, Reverend. In what? In the fact that the double you saw, the werewolf, if you like, meant your daughter no harm. And above all, the fact that he must return to Peter's physical body. Why do you need my help for that? Because you shot him. And although I know he meant Joan no harm... I also know that Sangri must possess other instincts of the wolf, and those instincts will be crying for revenge. Are you telling me that I... I'm not telling you anything, Reverend. I'm asking you to serve as a stalking horse, to bring Peter within reach, and then, then, to believe that I can handle it. going to have any second thoughts about being unarmed. I gave you my word, Carter. Let's get on with it. You go fetch Ernest. I'll be all right in that short time. I'm sure the Lord is watching over me. Let's hope he's watching over all of us. Ernie. Ernie. Come on out. Did you find Sangri? Not yet. How is Joan? She's restless. She's unhappy, but I think under control. Oh, good. Now, I think 
Peter knows the Reverend fired the shot that hurt him and is trailing him to get revenge. I've got the Reverend standing on a promontory over there. If the werewolf comes, I think I can gain control over him and get him back into Peter's body. I hope so. For all our sakes, I hope so. Peter! Peter! John! John, come back here! Let her go. We'll follow her. She'll lead us to him. Carter! Did you hear it? We're coming, Reverend. Hold on. No! Peter! Oh, Peter! Peter, I love you! <laughs> there. There it goes into Peter's tent. Let's hope it's in time. What about the Reverend? Joan will take care of him. Peter's the important one now. He's alive. Yes, but look. Those marks on his face. Are they gunshot wounds? They are, they are. The Reverend aimed well. The shots went through his cheeks. Oh, he'll carry the scars for the rest of his life. It was Joan who stopped him. Joan's voice and his love for her. I'm not sure that I would have been able to head him off. I... I've been hurt. My face. It burns. You're going to be just fine. Peter, my love. Joan. You're not frightened of me? Of course not. At first I was. I... I didn't really understand. But now I know that I belong with you. And I'll be with you, always. My face! Don't touch it. Joan, you bathe the wounds with clean water, and they'll heal naturally. Of course. And, Dr. Carter, thank you. Ernest, I think we're superfluous around here now. Right, Joan? That's right. Dr. Carter, my father has more need of you now. Than either Peter or I. And Joan's words proved to be true and not true. As Duane and I came close to Timmy's tent, we heard a voice, the voice of a man praying fervently, praying to his God for forgiveness. So this tale of a man who unconsciously used a werewolf to further his love's ambitions ended happily. And I no longer flaunt my skepticism. However, I must in all truth say that it's not really the recommended way to go courting, even in today's permissive atmosphere. Be back shortly. Magicians are well aware that people love illusion. They want to be fooled. I wonder if any of the great magicians ever wondered why there's such a universal love for magical tricks that seem utterly beyond belief. It's my fancy that we love illusion because we live in hopes that someday something magical will happen to all of us. Our cast included Mason Adams, Norman Rose, Marion Seldes, Christopher Tabori, and Guy Sorrell. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. W-A-B-C